Ooh. Yeah, watch out, watch out for the corn there. We're happy to welcome back uh, Elliot Radke this morning. He is pastor of Guest Experiences at Blaine. Yeah. We look forward to his message. Thanks, Dick. Thanks, everyone, for having me back. Like Dick said, I am the pastor of Guest Experience over at the Blaine campus. I was able to share with you guys last year at some point, so thank you for having me back. I'm guessing half of you weren't here, so like you didn't have a say in that, so that's great. Uh, my message today is focus on Jesus, but before I get into that, uh, I want to just share a little bit about me. Phyllis, do we have? Awesome. A little bit about me is my wife and I, we have two kiddos. So there's our family. We just got those pictures this year. And what you wouldn't see about this is this that morning, I was yelling at my son Aiden, who's going to be six in February. So he was crying as he was getting into the car. My wife Julie was having a disagreement with Lila, who will be eight in November. And she was crying getting into the car. And somehow the pictures turned out. So we're super grateful for that. But yeah, that is us. We live over in Blaine, and uh, we have a ton of fun. Uh, we love to spend time with each other, um, and we're real. We have arguments. We are able to get a family picture without everything being shown. So super grateful for them. I'll share a little bit more about them later on. But like I said, today I want to talk about focusing on Jesus, and really it kind of comes through this thought I've continue to have is our walk with Jesus. How many of you say that? How's your walk with Jesus going? How's your walk with God going? Or maybe even you're asking the questions, hey, are, are they walking with God? How's their walk with God going? And, and, and it's, it's true, because every day we have an opportunity to continue to take a step forward with God. It's a walk with God. And I don't know about you all, but I love going on walks. Who enjoys going on walks, short or long? There we go. Love it. Um, who has a dog that they'll take out for a walk? Couple? Fantastic. So we have a dog, Oak. He is a British lab. He'll be two in April. And I don't know if you just noticed this, but I was able to name my kids' birthdays and my dog's birthdays. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Pat, appreciate that. So he's going to be two in April. But... What I was so excited for was to be able to go on walks with this guy. In my expectation, he'd wake up at 7. We'd maybe go for a walk then. No, this guy, he'd wake up at 5.30 in the morning. And some of you are probably already up at that time, and you're like, hey, it's not that bad. So 5.30, it's like, all right, we'll start going on these walks. First day, we went out kind of maybe 6 o'clock. I let him just kind of chill a little bit. And we walked to the end and back. It was about a mile. I was like, this is going to be a fantastic routine for me. I'm going to be able to wake up, have a little bit of time with just myself and the dog, and be able to listen and pray and do all that. Well, the next day, things changed. He decided to walk. We got out of our cul-de-sac, got to the first house, and he stopped. And he sat down. I'm like, Oak. That's his name, Oak. Come on, let's keep going. He just sat. And I, like, I pulled his collar, and he just froze. I was like, all right, maybe he's just tired and not wanting to walk. The next day, I took him out, and here he is. He sat down, but not only did he sit down, he faced going back home. <laughs> he's facing going back home. And literally, we're about another 100 yards up, and there's our house. He wasn't having it. I was so confused. My thoughts, he's a lab, he's going to want to move, he's going to want to walk, but he didn't. So I'm like, two days in a row he's doing this, tomorrow it's going to be different. So I grabbed some treats, I was going to bribe him, because that's what you do with a puppy, you bring treats. He did the same exact thing, only 100 yards further. He caught on to my tricks. <laughs> my wife and I, we were trying to figure this out, like why, why would he not want to go for a walk? Why does he want to keep going further? We thought more and more about it. We're like, well, he's probably seen cars. He's unsure of what that is. We remember hearing a bigger dog barking at him behind a fence. So maybe he's a little scared. And home is comfort. Home is where he knows everything's safe. 
he's comfortable there, he's going to go back home. And then it hit me. I do the same in my life. I do the exact same thing in my life. I want to stay where I'm comfortable. I want to stay where I know I'm safe. And I do that with God. Where I feel very comfortable. God, I'm in a really good place. But then God's saying, hey, let's go a little bit further. I want to take your walk a little bit further. But then circumstances will change for me. It's into the unknown. Or it's a decision that financially it's like, God, this doesn't make sense. How am I supposed to give more when this is where we're at financially? Or maybe it's health. Or maybe for me it's, all right, God, what, what is next? And we experienced that in our lives. My wife, Julie, and I, um, God was inviting us to go into seminary. And we were terrified. Because financially it did not make sense at all. We were comfortable. We wanted to stay where we were. But we had to take that step. We had to trust what God was going to do. Maybe for you, it's, it's not seminary. It's not going for a longer walk. Maybe, maybe it's your blood work. You went in and got blood work, and all of a sudden it's not what you thought it was going to be. Maybe it's your kids, and their walk isn't where you would hope it would be. Maybe it's finances. Maybe it's even just the snow coming of like, I can't do the snow again. And so really the question is, how can we keep our focus on Jesus when our circumstances change? How can we continue to walk with Jesus when our circumstances change? When we can't see what's ahead and we want to stay where it's comfortable. What I love about the Bible is it's filled with stories with circumstances constantly changing. Where Jesus is showing he can go beyond the circumstances. So we're going to take a look in Matthew chapter 14. If you have your Bibles, you can pull those out. If you want, the verses are going to be on the screens. I'll be reading from the NLT version uh, there. And again, it's Matthew chapter 14. We're going to start in verse 22. And it's the story of Jesus walking on the water. Let me pull this up here for me so I can read it here. So starting 14, verse 22, it says, Immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. Well, I wasn't supposed to push that button. Uh, meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from the land, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on the water. When the disciples saw him on the water, they were terrified. In fear, they cried out, It's a ghost! But Jesus spoke to them at once, Don't be afraid. He said, Take courage. I am here. Then Peter called out to him and said, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. I love that. I love that. I wish I could be there seeing that. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he cried out. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? When they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshipped him, saying, you really are the Son of God. What I love about this passage is, is it gives us really three practical actions that we can take to continue to keep our focus on Jesus. There's three practical actions that we can take when our circumstances change. And the first one is to listen. Like I said, we have two kids, Lila and Aiden. Um, and Aiden, he is the loudest one in our house. He is vocally loud. Maybe you got a grandkid, or maybe your kid was like that. 
they're just vocally expressive. And here, oh yeah, here's a picture of him, handsome looking guy. Uh, but he is so loud. And we've had friends over to our house and they hear him playing, but they think his arm just got broken or something. They go, is, is he okay? Do you need to go and check on him? And we listen, we go, no, he's fine. He's having fun. He'll be outside and all of a sudden we hear screaming. And we're like, what is that? And we look and there he is, Aiden, biggest smile on his face. We know his voice. And I'm guessing you know the voice of your kids and your grandkids. You've learned their voice. <clears throat> what I love about this is that the disciples were able to recognize Jesus' voice. I don't know about you, but being out on the lake with wind and waves, it's really hard to hear. It's really hard to have a conversation when it's really going bad. But Peter was able to recognize Jesus' voice and say, Lord, if that's really you, like it really sounds like you, if that's really you, tell me to come on out. He was able to quiet himself down enough to recognize his voice. And for him, it's because he spent time with Jesus. He was able to know his voice, just like we, with Aiden, we, we spend a lot of time with him, and we know his voice. And for you, you probably, like I said, know the voice of your kids, your grandkids, the voices of your neighbors. You know when they're upset. You know when they're happy. Peter, because he spent time, knew his voice. And he was li willing to listen to his voice. 11 John chapter 10, verse 3 through 5, it says, The gatekeeper opens the gate for him. The sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he has gathered his flock, he walks ahead of them, and they follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They will run from him because they don't know his voice. Then it makes me wonder, what, what voices are we choosing to listen to? Are we listening to a stranger's voice that's taken us away and further away from our walk with God? Are we listening to the enemy's voice of like, well, you're, they're never going to get better. God's never going to bring this healing. Why do you keep praying? But we need to listen to that still, small voice of Jesus. Even when the wind and the waves are crashing. There was a time, don't judge me, all right? Please don't judge me. I have a bad habit that when I come home, so the mints here, I love, I love these Lifesaver mints. So I'll have a few at work, and sometimes I'll have extras in my pocket. I'll come home, I'll set my keys in my wallet on a thing, and then I'll, I start to empty out my pockets. And I kind of empty them wherever I'm standing. So sometimes it's on the counter by the kitchen, sometimes it's on the kitchen table, sometimes it's on like an end table in the living room. And my wife Julie is so patient with me, and she goes to me, Elliot, there are there's probably a million things you could say about me. But I, but I have to just tell you when, you, when you leave your mints all over the place, it's hard to keep the house tidy. The kids get after them, and it's just, it's just kind of messy. And again, she started with, Elliot, there's probably a million things you could say about me, but, right, that's the indicator, us guys, of saying, keep your mouth shut, Right? And in fact, the Holy Spirit was even telling me, Elliot, don't say anything. Don't say anything. Just receive it and go, yeah, I'll change that. I'll figure that out. But I chose to not listen to that voice. <laughs> and I was like, well, yes, I do leave those around, don't I? Let me tell you what you leave around. Yeah, uh-oh, I was right. It, we had a great evening. I mean, we had tension the whole night. The kids could feel it. We could feel it. The dog actually goes downstairs when we start to argue because he doesn't want to be a part of that. 
but I chose to not listen to that voice when I should have. And I think about how many times in my life do I choose to listen to that voice and not. And I love how in worship we heard that story where God was saying, sing the doxology. I know you don't ever do this, but, but sing it. Sometimes that voice might not make sense, but then when we do it, when we listen to it, there's fruit for others. People are encouraged and strengthened and reminded by God's love. Julie would have been reminded of God's love if I would have listened to that voice, but instead, we had an argument because I didn't listen to that voice. And for you, listening to that voice is so important. It's important for, maybe it's talking with your kids and you feel that voice saying, you know what, just, just leave it. Don't, don't say anything, just let them talk. Because I, I know I've ruined relationships where I've talked too much. Where I've had to come back and say sorry. I had to do that with Julie. I said, I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't have said anything. You're right. But it's when we listen to God's voice, when we listen to that prompting of the Holy Spirit, people are strengthened. And sometimes it's just not saying anything. And sometimes it's leaning in and taking that step. Just like Peter took that step saying, hey, if it's really you, I'm going to climb out of this boat and I'm going to walk on the water even though it doesn't make sense. The second practical action that we can take from this is to believe. And I love how Peter fully believed that it didn't matter that the physics didn't work out to walk on water. He believed that Jesus would keep him above the wind and the waves. There's times in my life where I believe I can do more than I'm actually able to do. Uh, being we have two kids, uh, we have a lot of door dings on our cars. Um, how many of you, yeah, you know that when the grandkids are opening the cars, you're like, hey, or maybe you find the further parking spot so that the doors don't hit the other cars. Well, I got a couple door dings, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to try to fix these myself. I just want to remind you of who I am. Uh, I didn't go to any, my, my, I'll just say my, my education, I went for elementary education, and then I went into seminary, so I have zero car experience. Like, I know how to drive, but fixing a car is probably not my skill set, but I believed I could. So I went to O'Reilly Auto Parts, and I told the guy, hey, this is what's going on. I got a few door dings. What can I do? He's like, oh, grab this little pen thing, make sure it matches the paint. What you'll do is it just kind of buffs it out, you paint it on, and then it'll like gloss over. <laughs> Perfect, I can do this. I have an education. I can do this. Friends, it looked like my kid took a white, white, white out marker to my car. I believed I could do it. Why? Because it seems simple. It seemed like I, it was something I could do, but that wasn't the case. I should have trusted my inability and taken it to a professional. But I was a little arrogant and prideful that I could do that. I love in Mark Batterson's book, Please Sorry Thanks, he says this, the average person spends about 95% of their time thinking about themselves. 95% of our time. Oh. But not about God. Not about the one who is able. They think about 95% of their time about themselves. I'm just curious, what would it look like if we even took 10% of our time thinking about what God is able to do. If we took ourselves out of the equation and said, God, what are you able to do? I love how 
the story starts in this. Back in Matthew 14, it started saying, immediately after this, Jesus told the disciples, hey, go start going across the lake. I'll take care of this crowd. But what was immediately after this? Well, immediately after that, Jesus had just fed the 5,000. He fed 5,000 people with just a few loaves of bread and fish. Jesus did that. And they had extras. And most likely, it wasn't just 5,000 because it was 5,000 men. So I'm guessing women and children were there too. So thousands, thousands of people. An extra. But immediately after that, a few hours later, there's Peter crying out for help. He had just forgotten what Jesus had done. I don't know about you, but I know for me, I often forget what Jesus has done in my life. I often forget what Jesus has done in my friends' lives, in my family's life. And I forget. So, believe. We need to continue to believe that God is able and willing to do what he says he will do. There's a verse in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 12. Because of Christ, this is Paul talking, because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. God's presence. And I think about Jesus' presence as he was with the disciples. He's healing thousands. He's feeding thousands. He's walking on water. Just his presence alone healed a woman who is sick for a dozen years. Just by his presence. What would it look like if we had this bold and confident faith? And I I looked up the word confidently um, in in, in Greek. In Greek, the word confident is this word here. I got to find my notes for that because I cannot pronounce it. Anybody can pronounce that one? Oh, where'd I put it? Oh, there it is. Pep oi the sis. Peperithesis. That's what it means. That's the word in Greek. And what's incredible about this meaning, it kind of, it, it, what it means is a spiritual produced persuasion. A spiritual produced persuasion. We're persuaded to believe a certain thing because of our experiences. Because what God has done. Paul, writing this, is in captivity. He's suffering. The next verse, he says, don't don't worry about my suffering. Count it as joy. He had spiritual produced persuasion. I wish I had more of that in my life. I wish I believed in God in a spiritual produced persuasion where when I'm facing a circumstance that's taken me out of my discomfort, I can go, I have spiritual produced persuasion where I know no matter what's going to happen, God is going to continue to be faithful. He's going to continue to be who he says he's going to be. And for you, maybe maybe your prayers are changed. God, I fully believe that you are going to heal my friend. You're going to take my grandson out of whatever captivity he's in. That there's a spiritual produced persuasion. This bold and confident prayer. Peter had it until a circumstance changed. I have it until my circumstances change. What I hope I can continue to do and grow in my walk with God is that I can live out this spiritual produced persuasion. Oh, I had the slide there. Look at that. The third action I believe we can take with this is to call out to him. To call out to him. My son Aiden, oh man, I got a lot of stories of Aiden. He's five. He's busy. Last, last winter was a really weird winter. There wasn't much snow. It wasn't all that cold. 
But when it got cold, it got real cold. And I love hockey. And I want my kids, I don't necessarily want my kids to play hockey, but I want them to be able to learn how to skate because that makes winters a little bit more enjoyable. And we have a little pond in our backyard. And so when it finally got cold enough, the ice got thicker and thicker. I went out and checked it a couple times. And finally, I felt confident that this ice was great. There was a little bit of snow on there. I started clearing it, and then Aiden was asking, Dad, hey, can I come out there with you? I said, sure. So I got his little skates on and all that. We're clearing the pond. My wife was working from home. Lila was in school, and we started clearing the pond. We were having a blast. Aiden got a shovel and started just moving snow wherever he wanted to. I was able to clear just a little bit of a rink for us and for the neighbor kids. And then I was just finishing it up, and Aiden's like, Dad, can I be done? Can I just go and skate and play? I said, sure. So I'm finishing it up. Next thing I know, I hear Aiden yell out, Dad! Dad! And there he is, just a little bit further away, next to the shore, by some weeds. But I know his voice, and I know when he's yelling out, Dad, when he really needs some help. So I skated over there as fast as I could, and as I got closer and closer, I could feel the ice getting thinner and thinner. And when I was about three feet away, there he is on all fours, staring at about a two-foot wide hole into open water. I was terrified. So I said, Aiden, I'm going to get closer to you, and I'm going to get closer, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab you. I'm going to take you right here, and I'm going to put you onto some thick ice. Sound good? He goes, sure. So I take one step closer, and as I step, I know this is my chance. I step, my leg broke through the ice, I lifted him, put him onto thick ice. My leg is about that deep in the water, up to my thigh. Aiden was dry. And I said, Aiden, go on inside. Tell mom, I'll explain everything later. Okay? Because I had to deal with that too. And so Aiden went on in. I ended up getting myself dried off. But what I was so proud about Aiden is I said, Aiden, you did the right thing. You called out when you needed help. You didn't try to fix it on your own. You didn't try to move away. You called out. And I was able to help you. I was reminded, how many times do I call out to God when I'm facing a giant hole? Or do I try to fix it on my own? Am I trying to get out of my own mess? Am I trying to just do it myself and being left wet and cold, frustrated and annoyed? And I think I, I call out on my own because I don't have that spiritual produce persuasion all the time. And I need to lean into that far more. And I think about you all. You all probably aren't going out on the ice, facing thin ice and all that. Maybe you are. Good for you. And maybe some of you are facing a different type of hole. Facing a different type of thin ice. Maybe it's your health, finances, your kids, your grandkids. My question is, are, are you calling out to God? God, help me with this. They're so frustrating right now. If they could only see what you can do, what a life walking with you looks like. If only they would have focus on you, Jesus. Calling out to Him is so important. And the other thought I had for you, for you all is are you a group that people are calling out to you? Because I believe this group of people here have incredible faith and wisdom. You have discernment. You understand the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And people should be calling out to you. And I know for me, in my life, 
I do have a few people that will call out to me when their life is going really hard. And then there's a few that don't, and it's because I didn't listen to the Holy Spirit to start with. I told them everything that they needed to be doing instead of just listening and paying attention to what the Holy Spirit was saying. So my my challenge to you for this calling out to Him, continue to call out to Him and continue to be a people where they will call out to you. Be willing to be available when you get a phone call, hey, this is going on. Man, that's really hard. I want to be there for you. I'm not going to try to fix it. I'm going to be there for you. I love how Peter, as soon as he started to go under, he called out. He didn't call out to Matthew, thank goodness. He didn't call out to any other disciples. He called out to the one who he knew would save him. And then Jesus goes, you have a little faith. You have a little faith. I just fed thousands of people. I just called you out to walk on that water. But what he didn't have was that spiritual produced persuasion that he could do it. So I'm going to keep encouraging you. One, continue to listen to God's voice. Continue to listen to each other here as you continue to grow in your walk with God. Continue to believe. Believe in a way where you have that spiritual produced persuasion. Encourage others by that. Share with others what God is doing in your life. And that's going to encourage them even more. And then call out. Continue to call out to the only one that can save. The only one that can pull you out of that hole. The only one that can heal. Whether it's a physical need, a spiritual need, a soul need, a relationship. And be ones that people can call out to you. God, we're grateful. We're grateful that you are a God that we can continue to call out to and that you're going to listen to us. doesn't matter what cry we have. You hear us. God, thank you that you are living and active, that you continue to speak to us through your word, through each other, through your Holy Spirit. God, I pray that we can pay attention to that voice. God, that we can have this spiritual produce belief in you, the spiritual produced persuasion that we can step boldly, no matter what circumstances we're facing, that we can continue to keep our focus on you because of who you say you are and what you've done in our lives. God, and I pray for those people around us. And maybe for us, it's, it's reaching out to them and asking, how are you doing? How can I specifically be praying for you? How can I help you? Maybe it's just an encouragement. I love you so much. I'm so proud of you. God, that we would be a people that look more and more like you because of our focus on you, Jesus. It's your name we pray. Amen. Hey, thank you again, everyone.